Good morning, Sevens fans, and welcome to uh, episode one of Rugby Sevens Now, a uh, new podcast from ur7s.com uh, with me, Tom Burwell. Uh, we're going to look each week at uh, the stories that were and the stories that are in Rugby Sevens around the world. Uh, it's an uh, ever-growing sport, as we all know, with things happening in every corner of the globe every single week. So uh, here at UR7s, we're going to do a quick 10-minute profile of all of the big stories so you know exactly what's going on here and around the world. Uh, the biggest story of this week, of course, is uh, England taking on Wales at Twickenham this coming Sunday. And I don't mean the Six Nations game. Uh, England Sevens will take on Wales Sevens in front of what has the opportunity to be a capacity crowd at Twickenham immediately after the Six Nations game. Um, this, of course, is a big change to how, how things have happened in the past for, for the Sevens, but not something new uh, down in the Southern Hemisphere. You guys will know that uh, in New Zealand and Australia have taken on one another. We've seen uh, female international games alongside uh, the men's games. Uh, we've seen it in half-time of Super League games, but it is certainly new to us in the Northern Hemisphere uh, and something which I think will go a long way to showing some of uh, the uh, older England Six Nations fans um, a bit more about the Game of Sevens because it's pretty obvious that the demographic of supporters that are at Twickenham for a Six Nations match is very different to the demographic of people that are at the London Sevens come May. So it will be an opportunity for both England and Wales to demonstrate what will be going to Rio in 2016. Fantastically as well, and both on the RFU and the BBC's part, is that it will be broadcast live on the BBC Red Button um, on the Six Nations Forum after 5pm. So you'll be able to get that online uh, as well on BBC .co.uk forward slash sport, I believe. Um, very interesting in the press release this week was uh, the lead comment from the RFU was from the commercial officer. Uh, we are delighted to showcase international sevens with England playing Wales on such a great stage in front of our fans. That for me is uh, quite telling and telling in how the RFU perceives sevens as a very much a commercial entity. Um, it was also great to see that uh, Lancaster, the, the head coach of England, also spoke about the importance of the England Sevens programme. Simon Amor has always spoken since coming back in that he wants to see the England Sevens squad as part, much more part of a, a performance pathway towards the 15s, as per it is in New Zealand and as per it was uh, probably slightly more directly under Mike Friday. Um, be interesting to see actually how that happens, but it's good to see the 15s and 7s are standing together uh, this weekend. Um, if you are at Twickenham, please stay, watch the game. It's 15 minutes of your life probably, but it's uh, 15 minutes played at an absolute racket of a speed. Um, there's some fantastic players on offer. Adam Thomas, unfortunately injured for Wales, but Chris, Chris Knight is, uh, is the winger to watch there for Wales. He's been superb this year. Um, and on the England side, you can uh, watch Marcus Watson, brother of Anthony Watson, and uh, perhaps... Watson will be involved in both 15s and 7s this weekend. Um, that's his brother, of course. And, um, and of course, the likes of Dan Norton and Matt Turner and Captain Tom Mitchell. Uh, names to be looking out for. Of course, not the only big thing going on this weekend. Um, huge tournament in Fiji uh, called the Maris 7s. It's the 38th Maris 7s tournament on the islands in Suva at the ANZ Stadium. Um, an opportunity, I think, to understand the depth of Rugby Sevens in Fiji in that there are 16 groups of four teams taking part in this competition. Uh, from the well-known sides like Red Rock, um, Wardens, Police, uh, Lomavite, Barbarians, uh, Yamasia, um, Nadroga, they are, they're all taking part um, you know, and they'll all be competing for the title. But there'll almost certainly be a, a number of sides that get shocked. Um, and you can see people like Nabua Nabarians, Coastal Eagles Sikatoka, uh, Rugby Club Namosi, South Sea Mariners, names that uh, you know, perhaps we don't know about and uh, uh, they're not well known from uh, outside of the Pacific region. But 
they'll almost certainly be uh, having players in there that will be competing for places in Ben Ryan's squad. Uh, and Ben spoke about it this week. Uh, he talked about the importance of tournaments like the Maris Sevens and that uh, he needs to just get out there and watch watch rugby. He spoke about the importance of, uh, uh, of searching for players across the islands because of the depth of talent that's there. From minute one upon him arriving in the, in the role in Fiji, um, and nothing's changed. He said this week, the search for Rio began when I started my job here. Every tournament in Fiji gives a player a chance to be seen and scouted. And the Mara Sevens this week, I suppose, also is not just giving opportunities to players that we might not have heard about. There's also the very real possibility that a number of players from overseas are back in the islands playing in the domestic sevens tournaments. Players like Setafana, Thalfal, former Fijians captain, Yona Vota, Yotuli Lutumalagi, uh, Talabula and Rayatini. Uh, they're all back. Uh, you know, they've got something to prove. And as Ben said again this week, he, you know, he said... I want to see them be standout performance and have the right attitude and prepared to work hard. Because in Fiji, there are people that are always the next man up. It's like the situation that you find with American football. They always say, the next man up, just fill the hole. With the depth of quality that there is in Fiji, that's exactly what is required. Ben talked about equal opportunities this week as well, saying that he was just going to pick on form. It didn't matter whether players were well-known running on the wing for Clermont or Verne in France, or playing in England, or whether they were playing and they were amateur rugby players and trying to force themselves into the squad in the islands. He was going to pick for Rio based on equal opportunities. It's a topic that's been used and thrown around quite widely over the past probably year, 18 months. Uh, it's looked at in England. Mike Friday and Phil Greening talk about it a lot, about how will Team G be made up? Will, uh, will players come from the Premiership? Will we see the likes of George North, Ben Foden, um, guys that have played well in the World Series in the past but have moved on to the 15s game? Or will we see boys that are playing week in, week out for the World Series? Will there be a crossover between 15s and 7s? The situation is very much the same in, in other countries with big 15s programmes. Uh, Gordon Titchens and former Australia coach Michael O'Connor both have spoke at length about uh, looking to bring players in, but bringing players in in the right way. Um, in 2006, Australia actually tried to do it and they brought in established players like Chris Latham. Um, New Zealand beat them in the way in the semi-finals. And it, it, the reason that didn't work was that Australia did not have enough time and those players did not have enough time. Not that they weren't good enough, they didn't have enough time to... Um, engage with the sevens game and get up to speed with the sevens game and the game's probably moved on to a much larger extent now as well which means that the opportunities for players just to fit in are, are much smaller and it's much much harder um in new zealand the likes of sonny bill williams and uh benji marshall have been thrown about um quite often and and you know titchens has said yeah that's very interesting anything could happen um but Sonny Bill Williams has obviously got to come back to Rugby Union first. Um, same with Benji Marshall. Benji Marshall's been spoken about as a fine touch player, someone that's, you know, a, a sport that in New Zealand is considered the nearest relation to sevens. Um, Titchens thinks that he'd pick up the game whatsoever and he's on paper saying as much. But people like Sean Johnson, who sort of was electric at the NRL Nines the other week, uh, Titchens has never even met. So a lot of it is hearsay. Um, one thing I think we do know is that if they are going to come into a New Zealand squad, they're going to come into a New Zealand squad during the World Series and the year leading up to the Olympics. Um, in Australia, I think it's probably going to be really interesting to see what happens now that O'Connor's moved on. Uh, but it's a you know, big comment from the Australian Rugby Union only two weeks ago was talking about the importance of an Olympic gold medal. And in fact, that that would take priority for Australia in 2016. Um, CEO Bill Pulver, who is a big supporter of the Austra uh, of Sevens game in, across the world, let alone in Australia, has spoken about how once they get to 2016 and pass the 2015 World Cup, the most important thing for Australian rugby in that year will be to win a gold medal. That will be over Test Match Rugby, over Super Rugby, over... Um, the Rugby Championship, 
the most important thing will be lining up to win that gold medal in Rio come the Olympic Games in 2016. Um, in fact, he's, what he said, the Associated Press, was that I personally take the view that if you look at the objectives for 2016 for Australian rugby, I think winning a medal in the men and women's events is right up there as our number one priority for a year. No one else in the world right now has been able to say, put their hands up and go, that is what our target is going to be. That is a gutsy call from the Australian CEO. There will be almost certainly people in uh, Australia that look at him and say, hey, that's, that's a big call. But actually, it's a big tap on the back for Rugby Sevens. O'Connor's gone now. Um, and, you know, Another coach has fallen to the wayside for family and personal reasons in that the World Series is proving too much, which again is credit to people like Ben Ryan and Gordon Titchens that have been on it for so long. Um, but whoever comes in as that Australia coach will go in with that understanding that they've got two years to go to the Olympics. One, they've got huge pressure to return in the Olympics, but two, they also know they've got the biggest support of the, of the union behind them for that year. And I'm not sure that somebody like Simon Amor or whoever might be the Team GB coach, Mike Friday, will feel that they've got the total support of the union in, in, a, in an Olympic year. Uh, if they have, then it will be very interesting to see which players play for them. But likewise, with that call from the ARU, I think it becomes even more likely that we see the people like Izzy Falau play. Um, he certainly would be a fantastic player. Um, who goes with him? Curtly Beal, possibly. He's talked about the wanting to play rugby sevens at Rio. Um, but we'll have to wait and see. But it, you know, big, interesting calls being made all the time there. Um, it brings me back to Fiji before we move on and, and Fiji are, are struggling with players signing up overseas and being lost to um, club contracts for financial reasons. Ben Ryan's spoken about the fact that there are scouts just in the Fijian Islands all the time, either NRL clubs, New Zealand um, uh, and now European clubs as well. Hugely difficult for, for Ben and, and a pressure that Perhaps no other nation is under that is in direct line light. Samoa, of course, but um, my understanding of that is less. It will be very interesting to see how Ben tries to counteract that. Fiji have got some financial backing now due to the Vodafone consortium that have come in and, and, and sponsored the side through to 2016. And they've talked about um, contracting players. But Ben's also talked about the breadth and depth of talent in Fiji and he can't contract 100 players. Um, and that player 99 may well be nearly as good as player 13. So if you're going to contract 16 to 20 players, you better get the 16 to 20 players right. Um, and if you don't, spending money on those guys, is it then going to work? How is that dynamic going to change the way that sevens for the national squad works in Fiji? Um, you can tell when only last year in the World Series they used 40-odd players. That's not the way it should be done, but it shows that there is a much more transient model in Fiji and how the game works. Um, I understand the need to keep players in the country and there needs to be something to be done to help Ben and the union be able to create that for them. Um, but it's not without its own problems because it's so different to how it, it currently is. Um, though I think Ben Ryan's probably the man to, to look at that. Um, in, intelligent, good coach, um, good leader of a programme, understands how to build a programme. I think he's probably learning on the job still out there and under a great deal of pressure both within the island and outside of the island. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll see how he goes and, 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 and good luck to him. Um, before we cross off, we're looking at you know, the growth of rugby in, the, in Australia and the tournaments that are being played. Week after week now, there's a $2,000 tournament played in New South Wales, it seems, um, with 13 to 16 teams. Reminds me very much of the way that the UK was 10 years ago, which is just providing more opportunities to play rugby, giving people the chance to play the sport. And having seen Tribe Sevens play so well in Dubai and, you know, obviously Shanghai Sevens champions as well, the growth of the invitational side in Australia is, is becoming stronger and stronger. Um, and of course, that's been led by, for me, two, two big trailblazers of tournaments out in Australia. The first being 
um, the Central Coast Sevens run by Craig Morgan in New South Wales, uh, and the other being uh, the Noosa International Sevens with Phil Slattery. Um, both tournaments fantastic. Central Coast probably slightly more um, fleshed out, slightly slightly bigger. Um, they've announced the first nine sides competing in in their tournament this year, um, with sides from Australia, including Warringah uh, and Tribe and Sunnybank, um, through to Devita, who are a uh, big side from Fiji, representing the Nadroga region, uh, Rangantau, who are the Middlesex Sevens champions, which is basically the Club Sevens champions in New Zealand, um, Yamasia, who won the uh, Coral Coast Sevens championship in Fiji last year, um, and then the New Zealand Four Nations, which is an invitational side associated to the New Zealand College Rifles Club. Uh, and Rangan, uh, sorry, uh, that's, uh, of course, the big important one is, uh, is Tiger Rugby, um, run by James Walker and um, Paul Holmes in the USA. Uh, Tiger Rugby um, perhaps doesn't get as much press as uh, the Serevi guys, but the work that they're doing with the uh, Olympic academies in, a, in America and the growth of the sport and from my understanding doing it the right way uh, touring with great kids that are a credit to not only the program but the USA when they're on tour um, similar to uh, when Atlantis uh, used to tour which was a, a very famous American invitational side that did it the right way um, these guys are now doing it with an Olympic sense but still are um, going around the world, showing American rugby in the best light. Uh, luckily, we'll see them here in the UK um, next month uh, at the Melrose Sevens. Um, they went to Shanghai, uh, and it will be great to see them in, um, in Central Coast as well. Uh, the opportunities for American rugby players are, are growing by the week with organisations such as Serevi Rugby and uh, the Tiger Rugby Academy and the other Olympic academies that are across the country. The work that Nigel Melville and the USA Rugby have done to support the Sevens sort of structure there is is huge. Um, I say to people all the time that there are more tournaments uh, than than anywhere else in the USA. Uh, once we hit the summer, there are just hundreds and hundreds of opportunities for people to play the game from the college sport through the social game. And, and at some point that's going to go right. They've had a struggle season this year and I'm, you know, I speak out against the way that they are playing the game at the highest level. I think they look a little uh, toothless, but the structures that are being put in behind, if once they get that right, uh, things will improve vastly. Uh, finally, before we, we log off for another week and, and we're going to be doing this podcast every Every Thursday from now on, I'm going to be inviting guests on. Next week, we'll have an interview with uh, England forward Chris Cracknell. Um, but every week, we'll try and speak with somebody about one of the pressing issues that's going on. We're going to talk about Kenya next week, um, the growth of the sport there, the fact that the UR7s Academy will be taking place there in um, August and September this year. We're going to look at Africa as a region in general. Um, and each week we're going to look at different areas of the world and tournaments that are going on and exciting things that are happening and being announced in the, in the World Series. But we can't, we can't log off without talking about the fact that the uh, schedule has been announced for next season for the HSBC World Series. Of course, the Olympic qualification year with the top four qualifying for Rio in 2016. Uh, interestingly, um, no announcement as to why, but Wellington and USA have been flipped back round. Um, as of Tokyo and Hong Kong so Wellington is on on the week that it always is um, as per usual on the on the bank holiday weekend um, but instead of USA being the week before as it was this season it's the week after again as it has been for many years which um, as it's a three day tournament means that it is the short week turnaround um, it is the huge long flight it is the dealing with the jet lag and it is uh, then on to the narrow field, which many coaches I've spoken to over the past five years have said that is not ideal. So it's interesting to see that the World Series has gone back to that again. Um, the Tokyo-Hong Kong one has flipped back round. Presumably that's a date reason because we haven't even seen those legs take place this season yet. So um, it can't be that it hasn't worked. Um, it will be interesting to try and get to speak to somebody at the IRB and I'll try and do that over the next week so we can talk about it next year, uh, next, in the next podcast, sorry. Um, the, the World Series next season is so important. 
finishing in that top four for those bigger nations, uh, especially if you're a Pacific or African nation. I mean, Europe as well to a certain extent, but England are the only ones that have really knocked on the door of finishing in the top four of the World Series over the past five years. Um, but in, uh, in the Pacific region, for example, um, those that don't finish in the top four, let's say a top four would, was England, New Zealand, South Africa. No, England, New Zealand, Samoa, and Australia. That would give us uh, South Africa and Kenya both having to qualify out of the African region. It would give us USA and Canada both having to qualify from the North American region. And it would give us um, two of the major Pacific nations having to qualify out of the Pacific region. Meaning that even if each one, one of those qualifies from, the Pacific, uh, from their regional competition and then one qualifies from the global competition, two of those big names are going to miss out. So that is what at stake and that all stems from the security of that top four. The security of getting yourself into that top four on that World Series. So the pressure is on immediately. Rather than us looking at who might get relegated, what might happen here, what might happen here, individual tournaments taking place, suddenly the pressure is on. Because everyone, since 2009, when that decision was taken, that Rugby Sevens would be back into the Olympic Games, everyone has talked about taking part in Rio. And your first opportunity to say, hey, we're going to be in Rio, and we're going to be competing for that gold medal, is to finish in that top four. Um, and on that bombshell, in, uh, in true Top Gear style... Um, I'm going to clock off. This has been Rugby Sevens Now with UR7s.com's Tom Burwell. Um, we'll be back next Thursday. Enjoy the Sevens. If you're going to be at Twickenham this week, cheer on England or cheer on Wales. If you're going to be in the Maris Sevens, watch some unbelievable Sevens in the Fijian Islands. Um, enjoy it. It's the greatest sport in the world. And I'll see you all next week. Thank you.